salutations upon the last hujjat of Allah upon this earth, Hazrat Baqiyatullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad wa The one who has been the promised one in the Holy Quran, who will fill this earth with justice and equality, just as it is filled with injustice and inequality. We await the hujjat of Allah so that we may accompany him and be counted among those who strove in his path. Allah says in the Holy Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Mubarab Allah, Mathal Alladina Qafaru Imra'atan Nuh wa Imra'atan Lut Qanata Tahta Abdain min Abadina Qanata Abadina Swalihina Fakanata Huma Fila Yugna Anhuma min Allah Shay'an Wakala Udhala An Nara Ma'adda Khaleen Wadarab Allahu Mathal Alladina Lilladina Amanu Imra'ata Fir'aun إذ قالت ربي ابن لي عند في الجنة والنجينا من القوم الظالمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وخل الأختة من لساني يفقه قولي Brothers and sisters in Islam سلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah says in the Holy Quran that an example has been given to you from those who were the disbelievers, the wife of Prophet No and Prophet Lot. They were with and under the shade of our righteous servants, but they were false and they did wrong and they profited nothing from Allah on account except that Allah told them to enter into the fire and remain in it forever. And then Allah says in Surah Al-Tahreem, continuing, that Allah set forth an example from those who believe about the wife of Fir'aun, who is called Asiya. And behold, she said, O oh my Lord, build for me in your nearness a mansion in the gardens of paradise and save me from Fir'aun and his doings, his actions, and save me from those who do wrong. Today's lecture is about, as we all know, the lady without whom Karbala would have been incomplete. Before we look at the life of Hadra Zainab, we would like to talk about, I would like to discuss with you about the role of women through the Quran, the approach which society had towards women, and finally, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what do the Imams say about the position of women? So when we look at, we look at it from, the, uh, from a three-way approach. Number one, which is the popular belief about women in a male-oriented society? The first answer to this question that how did the, this society look upon a woman as? So according to popular belief, a woman should not, could not, and did not have any direct role to play in the society. Certain religions said that a woman was corrupt and she corrupted the people around her. So confine her to the house and let her be with what she has been assigned to do. In other words, keep her uneducated, keep her segregated. 
Then we came upon another aspect of how society looked upon women. Then came feminism and trying to get equality between the two sexes. That happened in the late 19th and early 20th century. The name given to this movement was liberization. Liberate the woman, liberate her from her the shackles of backwardness, educate her. And that was in itself a good thing, but it was not put to proper use. And as we see, they said human education can only go forth if the mother is educated, which was the Islamic viewpoint taken in by the others and so-called progressive societies. But then we saw that along with this progress and economic independence came certain social evils. Women were used where they were not needed to be used. And we saw the woman as an object of desire under the, ter the term and the label of being progressive. The third approach and the approach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his creation. And what does he say? The man and the woman has been created in their own orbit and they perform their own roles. Quran describes this man and woman history and it says the first person that Quran talks about as a woman we see the story and the parable of Hazrat Adam and Hazrat Hawa. While she was blamed for the sin committed, Quran says that the responsibility was placed equally upon both. The next surah which I want to talk to you about Allah talks about Hazrat Sarah and Hazrat Hajra. He loved the dedication that they showed towards the deen and towards the hujjat. And Allah speaks about both these. Hazrat Sarah is referred to in Surah Al Hud, ayat number 73. Hajra referred to in Hud, ayat number 75. <coughs> Then we go on to find out about the mother of Musa. Quran, Surah Al Qasas, ayat number 7. Surah Al Araf, ayat number 19, 20, and 22. Further on, the Quran talks about a lady to whom he dedicates an entire surah, Surah Al Maryam. And he discusses. He says that the role of Maryam was so vivid and the prophet Isa is introduced through his mother. And it is said that Maryam communicated with the angels. The question arises that why then didn't Allah make any of these women as prophets? They are women par excellence. Their sifat, their characteristics have been placed in the Quran for times to come. But why weren't they made prophets? So that we would also have some leaders and guides. And Allah answers this and he says, and when we look at, I was just discussing this this morning in another majlis that uh, we cannot see Quran in isolation. We need, we need the itrat of the Prophet to explain this Quran to us. Because those who saw the Quran in isolation and said that the book was enough, we see that they have corrupted the faith, their Iman, and the larger picture of Islam. And here we see 
that our fifth holy Imam, Imam Bakr alayhi salawatu Allah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa jilfar. Imam says that the woman, due to the emotional nature that she possesses, which Allah has made it an inherent part of her, the softness of the heart, the inherent emotional behavior that she has. The role of the Prophet was one of a warner and a bringer of good tidings. And at times, the woman would have been emotionally bound and not been a warner to the nations. And then it is said that even though she was not made a prophet, the sifat, the characteristics were nonetheless. And then in order to explain to us that what it, it means to be a woman created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he talks about this in Surah At-Tawbah, Ayah 27. And he says, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدُونَ فِيهَا مَسَاقِينَ تَيَّبَا فِي الْجَنَّاتٍ أَدْنَانِ وَالرَّذْوَانُ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْضَ الْعَظِيمَ And he has promised the believing men and the believing women. And he says that the basis of this Jannat, which he is promising us, the basis of this is spirituality or taqwa. And each one of us has been given a domain to perform our acts, in which Allah says that if you act righteously, then there is a paradise which is everlasting. Now let us see, when Allah talks about all these women, there are two or three women I would like to talk about and then go towards Hazrat Zainab. When we saw Quran speak of Sarah and Hajra and Asiya and Maryam, and when he spoke about the believing women, he gives us amidst this glorious Quran the word Kawthar. And with Kawthar, he means abundance, abundance in piety, abundance in the goodness which comes out from Kawthar. And where Surah Tahrim says that what is the reason why she was buried alive where the Arabs buried their daughters. Here is a prophet of Islam, the last one when his daughter comes into the bosom of the prophet. Here you find him standing up and acknowledging her. He gave her kawthi. Allah says, I gave you kawthar, abundance. And I, it is says that when Quran says a, a baby girl was sh a shame, they, their faces went black and they did not know where to place this child. And at that time, Allah says that, O oh Prophet, the woman that I have bestowed upon you to be your daughter will be to an equally spiritual lady called Khadija. Hazrat Khadija, in the time when economic freedom was unheard of, it is said that she was one of the richest merchants and traders and the businesswoman of Arabia. Just for your information and knowledge, it is said that she had so many camels which did business between the cities of Yemen and Hejaz, as far as Persia, as far as Andalus, which is the, the modern Spain. And she was the one who showed us that the limits which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set upon a woman, if you are within those limits, then economic freedom and working you know, we were told about to talk about women empowerment and things. 
So when you look at the lives of these women, I don't think we need to dissect them in different categories. When you talk about the seerah of Hazrat Khadija or Hazrat Fatima, we look at all these, at how empowered the woman was even in those days. And then we see that when he gives martyrdom, he says, Wala ladina kutilu fi sabilillahi amwata. He says, do not consider the ones who are slain in the way of Allah as dead. They are alive. And then we see that history talks about one of the martyrs of Islam, Hazrat Sumayya. So he did not limit even the taste of martyrdom from a woman. And this is the equality we talk about. And to this glorious religion do you and me belong. My hijab is not an impediment. <coughs> I have an interesting incident to share with you. Uh, it's about Lauren Booth. We know that she is the British, the Prime Minister's sister-in-law, much talked about. And examples have been given about the way she converted to Islam. I have something to share with you about her daughters. There was a mail I received and it said that, uh, uh, you know, when she came home and she broke the news to her children that uh, she had become Muslim and she had accepted Shia Islam. It is said that there was silence in the drawing room. So she went about the chores, she writes it herself and she said, I went about the chores and I went to the kitchen and I started doing my work and my... I saw my daughters dazed and then they followed me into the kitchen and they said that mom uh, so you become a Muslim so she said yes so she said that so now will you give up smoking <laughs> because she used to smoke mm. he said yes it is not haram but if I follow a particular leader he does not permit me, so yes, I will give up smoking. So the girls say, yay. <laughs> the second question they asked her, so mom, now that you become Muslim, will you stop wearing tight clothes? <laughs> because the girls used to be embarrassed of their mother's sense of clothing. And she said, yes, because the Sharia that I follow now says that I am as priceless as that pearl or the diamond which lies in our bank locker. <laughs> now I need to be covered. And then so on and so forth. They asked her and they asked her about, she said that uh, because she had multiple problems of uh, you know, health, said, so now you will stop eating the haram food and so on. Can you imagine these girls said that we love the fact that you took up Islam. They love it for their reason. She accepted it for her reasons. But you see what happens at the end. Here we have a Muslim woman with her two non-Muslim daughters explaining to her, asking her, and then celebrating their mother's conversion to Islam. So woman empowerment, and the female hijab, I would like to discuss before we go into the female hijab, let us look at Karbala and how the woman's role was. When Lady Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayhi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad wa jil Lady Fatima, her role in the religion with her father came forward and came forth in Mubahila when she was taken with her father. She went to the court to ask for her rights and following the same trend, Imam Hussein takes his family to Karbala showing that if a woman is on the right and if she has she is within the orbit that Allah has asked her to maintain 
she can be alongside with a man. When we see the taharat and the ismat of Fatima come into Mubahila, it is said that the Prophet and the Imams and then the ismat and last is Vilayat. They go in this way. And then the Najran, the people of Najran say to <coughs> amongst themselves that I see faces among these that if they were to ask Allah for the wrath of Allah to descend, then the wrath would descend. And when Imam Hussein takes Bibi Zainab to Karbala, as another um, incident from recent history, Bintul Huda, the sister of Shaheed Baqar al-Sadr alayhi rahma When Shaheed was killed by the tyrant forces of Saddam, he saw to it that he killed Bintul Huda as well. Reason, he says, I wouldn't want to make a mistake like Yazid did that he killed Hussein, but he let Zainab live. And it is through Zainab that the message of Hussein went to every nook and corner of the world. And we see that for such an event of Karbala, <coughs> there had to be a Zainab who could justify and who could take forward the mission if Hussein is the martyr of master of the martyrs in Karbala, then Zainab is the messenger of Karbala. If Hussein and his companions fought against the tyrannical regime of Yazid with their swords, then Zainab and the ladies fulfilled that struggle with their words. If Imam Hussein and his companions revived Islam with their blood, then Zainab and the ladies carried on the messages with their speeches. It is said that if you would permit me, since all of you recited poetry in English, I would like to recite a few couplets for Hazrat Zainab in Urdu. Husayniyat ki negaban dine haqqa waqar. Husayniyat ki negaban dine haqqa waqar. Hazar shams and kamar teri azmato pe nisar. Ghurur and jabr ki dharti pe hurriyat ki pukar. Yazid, in his passion, his taqabur. Ghurur and jabr ki dharti pe hurriyat ki pukar. Hurriyat, freedom. Yazid, yat ki muqabil ki ahani tu divar. Wo jis zarb se mismar khaybar e shab hai. Us ikhtiyare mashiyat ka naam Zainab And this is Zainab. Let us see what the historians of Ahli Sunnah have to talk about Zainab. So today, and I decided that uh, we often talk about Hazrat Zainab through our books. What do the people who came to Karbala and after Karbala spoke about Zainab? And much after the, the event of Karbala, when the books were written, <coughs> what was written in it? Tabari, in his tariq, speaks about Zainab. And he says that, uh, I saw Zainab look like her mother in kindness and like her brother Abbas in her valor. Mm. These are the words. I know I do not know whether all of you understand it. It is said that, Tarif the Wujud Dushman Kari. What praise is it for Zainab when I praise her? But when a person who just acknowledges her achievement and then praises her, not knowing who she is. As whenever I read about the leaders of my country, like Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Radha Krishnan and Sarojini Naidu, these are Indian authors and Indian poets and Indian politicians. When they say that we took inspiration from Hussein, it gives us immense pride that we are the followers of that Hussein. 
And it is said that Hamid bin Muslim, the one who wrote the Maqtal of Karbala, because he was he was appointed by Yazid's army. So technically he is also from the part of the enemy camp. And Hamid bin Muslim says that when he says, I saw Zainab on the fields of Karbala, I saw a woman who shone like a sun and she came out of the tent. When she came out of the tent, someone asked me, who is she? They said that she is Zainab, the daughter of Fatima and Fatima is the daughter of the Prophet of Allah. I asked them then that is this the descendants, the Prophet's descendants who we decided to slaughter? And Hamid bin Muslim says that, I said, woe upon me. He curses himself. And he says from that point onwards, my pen used to fall down when I used to write the events of Karbala as they unfolded in front of my eyes. And we say that how does the Kirdar, the character of Zainab really come about? When does it come about? Before the Shahada? No. Before the Shahada, we would give her the credit of being Imam Hussein's confidant, the one who raised Ali Akbar, the one who the women turned to. Why? Woman empowerment at its best. Aqilatul Bani Hashim. The intelligent, the wise one of Banu Hashim. Who bestowed this title upon her? Ibn Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet says, O oh Zainab, you are Aqila. Education. Rights of women. Today? No. 1400 years ago in the family of the Prophet. <coughs> and then we look at Zainab, the events of Karbala post the Shahadat, the courage, the patience, the adversity, the blood, the trauma. The pain of being separated from the ones she loved, the ones she had nurtured. She said to Yazid in the khutbah, which we've all been distributed, she said to Yazid, Yazid, you know who was Hussein? The earth was narrow for him to crawl upon. He crawled upon your prophet's chest. This was Yazid. And this was Hussein and how Zainab introduced Hussein to him. No one but the wise could have used words to connect the Prophet and Hussein to such an advantage that the people around her were weeping. The words she chose to speak. It is said, Ibn Hajar al Qalani in his book Al Isaba says, Zainab was wise. She was insightful and she says that the reply of Zainab to the Shami man when, when in, the, in the court of Yazid, when the famous statement which has been much discussed in this Muharram, what did you see when Hussein was killed? And she answered, I saw nothing but beauty. beauty. Why beauty? Because she saw la ilaha illallah being saved. Why beauty? Because she said that when I witness, tell me which man, which parent in this world would do such that shukr when his son dies. And she said, I saw Hussein. And I heard the ayat of Quran being recited. Ya mutma'in. Tell me who other person at Shahada has been addressed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh soul who is at rest. When you are dying, you in, you are in unrest. And you're killed, you're, you're dying. If you know you have to die, 
you would be in a state of agitation. You would not be in a state of rest. And Imam Hussain, and that is why she says, I saw nothing but beauty. And then, Asqal Asqalani says that the reply of Zainab to Yazid shows the wisdom, the confidence, and the spirit of this great lady. And when she finished her speech in Kofa, which I do not want to discuss right now because we have constraints for time as well, she says that when she finished speaking to Ibn Ziyad, if they have not yet reached the court of Yazid, they are still in the court of Ibn Ziyad in Kofa. And she says, when she finishes her speech, you know what Imam, the Hujjat of the time, the fourth holy Imam says, oh my aunt, I thank Allah that you are alima, ghayr muallima, and you have never been, you are so learned yet you have never been taught by any human teacher. Allah Akbar. You know this comparison of not being taught by a human has only been used for the Prophet. If you can imagine where we are going tonight in this journey with Lady Zainab. Only one other person in the entire universe has been addressed that you are the one who was on me, not illiterate and lettered by man. And then we see that this is used for Zainab. You were a, a learned one who did not have any worldly teacher to teach her. And in Balagatul Nisa, Ibn Taifur says that when I entered Kofa after the martyrdom of Hussein, I swear to God, I had not seen a woman more eloquent and fluent than Zainab. And she had to be, Balagatul Nisa is the name of the book. Balaga, Balagat of Fasahat is traits of eloquency. And he says, I swear by Allah, I had never seen a woman more fluent and eloquent than her. She spoke fearlessly and she spoke confidently. Women empowerment. Oh Yazid, you can chain us with our hands, but you cannot chain our minds. You cannot chain our Iman. And then she says, for you who took away our veils. You know how she addresses Yazid in his own court. This khutbah that you have is a concise one. Alhamdulillah. We've been blessed to spend this night because this is Ashra Arba'een. As we come closer to the nights of Arba'een, we remember the role of this noble lady. Every revolution has two messages, the blood and the message. The ones who were Husayni remained in Karbala. And the Zainabis went to Sham. And she goes to the court of Yazid, tell me, it requires great courage to speak in the court where there are hundreds of na maharam. For the one, it is said, Ibn Hajar says in his book, that whenever Zainab was seen in Makkah or Medina, we never saw the sun upon her back. And she is in front of a minimum of 700 and maybe more in the markets and the roads of Sham. Yet she talks to Yazid. She says, I will scold you and I will humiliate you. She uses these words in Arabic. I will humiliate you. Can you imagine? He is a king, a tyrant. He has the entire machinery with him. And here is Zainab in chains. And she says, she addresses him as Yabnat Tolaqa. Yabnat Tolaqa. Tolaqa were the ones who accepted Islam after the Prophet migrated to Medina. 
and she says that the Tolaka can never be Khulafa. Understand this part of history. And she said this to him. And she says, Oh, Yabna Tulaka, oh, the son of freed slaves, the one whom my grandfather freed. <coughs> and she says, Is this justice? That the women of your family should remain behind the veil? And the family of Fatima? And the family of the Prophet, the Prophet's daughter, should be paraded between from place to place? You have insulted our dignity and your rebellion against God, she says. And then she speaks about the captives and she says, Yazid, surely for you, the end of those who do evil is only evil. And she says, Yazid, do not feel elated and do not think that you have defeated us. For very shortly you will pay the penalty of your crimes. What will you answer the Prophet Yadid when you will face him? And she says, God is not unjust to anyone. We trust in him. You see the topic number three. Her courage in adversity, her reliance upon Allah. Even in those times, she says, I trust my Allah that he will put you to your end, the end that you deserve. And she says, she quotes Quran, Every tyrant will see how he is taken back to the gulm that he perpetrated. And she says, Yazid, you can never reach the lofty position of my brother. You cannot destroy our remembrance. And your disgusting act, <coughs> it can never be wiped out. When she returned after that speech, it is said that Sayyid Sajjad stood by her and he speaks to her and Imam Sajjad says that from the time my aunt entered the court, he explains very vividly what happened and he says that when my the rope was tied around the throat of the women folk. The throats and their necks were getting choked. It is said that she, whenever the children slowed down, the tyrant forces used to whip them. Zainab in her old cloak, she sat down amidst Fizza with the other ladies. Some of the bondsmaids had come with Hussein, the slave girls. Zainab sat there, they said, we were made to sit in a corner like slaves, like menial ones. And yet, in that corner where Yazid made our family to sit, Zainab shone apart. So much so that through his drunken stupor, he points out and says, Who is that noble lady? Who is that lady? And they said, She is Zainab, the daughter of Ali. And it is said that Zainab then spoke and she just spoke and said, my brother along with his companions, he says, 
How did you find this action of God upon your brother? He meant, he meant to ridicule Zainab and say that God killed him and willed us to win. And she said that my brother and his companions joined their high positions in paradise along with my father and my revered grandfather and my mother and my grandmother. And he says, and you will soon reach the end that has been destined for you. And she says, O oh, Yazid, how does it suit you and befit you that you chain us and you're, we are deprived of our rights, of our, of our hijabs? It is said that in the court of Yazid, he sat on a high throne and the head of Hussein was kept in a tray. Each time Yazid would, with his staff, hit upon the head of Hussein. And each time, through her tears, she said, Yazid, don't do that. I had seen the lips of the Prophet kiss this face a hundred times. And Yazid in his stupor, in his drunken state, he kept on doing that again and again. And then it is said that Sakina, the daughter of Sayyid, when she saw this, she said to Zainab, Oh, my aunt Zainab, tell Yazid to take the head away. For when I see the head in this condition, I can't bear it. The separation, oh, my father with you. And then it is said, Zainab looked towards Medina and said, Oh, Muhammad. And she said, Oh, my noble grandfather, the son of your daughter, his head has been severed. His jugular vein has been cut. He remains with his body without a shroud on the battlefield of Karbala where the dust recognizes his superior qualities and envelopes his body <coughs> while Yazid parades the head when it is said when the lamentation of Zainab rose the people who were present in the court of Yazid started to lament with her. The women lamented. And it is said that the purpose of Zainab was served in Karbala and Sham. And her lamentation eventually led to the Inkalab in Sham. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon ridhan bi qazaihi wa tasliman li amal. Allahumma salli'ala Thank you, Sister Samara, for that inspiring lecture. And Allah bless you and your family. Um, can we have one more loud salawat for her? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa jilfar. Um, so uh, before Ziyarat, um, I just have a few announcements. Um, so one from December 30th to January 3rd from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Um, here in al uh, we'll be having lectures by Sayyid Hassan Ali Rizvi, um, entitled From Muslim to Moment. So once again, that's December 30th. 
to January 3rd from 9 to 10 p.m. here in Elkley. Um, and I'd like to call on Sister Massimo for a few closing remarks. Um, and tomorrow. Sister Massimo. Sunday. Uh, Sunday and uh, Sunday. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you again for everyone attending tonight. Um, I'm going to do a closing remarks, and after that, um, I'd like to call up Brother Safraz, um, who will just quickly mention what our group is doing again, and Brother Hamad will end with dua. Um, Inshallah, if, uh, we can also, if there is someone who would like to do a noha, please uh, let Sister Alia know within the next five minutes. Um, all of human history shows that the human spirit strives in many directions, deriving strength and sustenance from many sources. The highest honor lies with Karbala's spiritual significance. Imam Hussein and Bibi Zainab they paid their own lives with the penalty of resistance. Imam Hussein and Hazrat Zainab made no compromise with evil. They chose the path of danger with duty and honor, and they never swerved from the path of truth, giving up their lives freely and bravely. Their story purifies our emotions, and we can best honor their memory by allowing it to teach us courage and submission into our lives through the remembrance of Allah in all of our actions. While the entirety of Karbala's potential to function as a moral and spiritual inspiration is impossible to capture, it is highly relevant in our lives and in our times. The need to stand against evil and oppression, the primacy of human rights, However, despite being almost 14 centuries later, the events of Karbala and Sham provide us with a rich template which we can deploy to examine the way we conduct our lives. Imam Hussein Islam had called on the day of Ashura. He said, is there anyone to help me? Is there anyone to help me? No one was there to answer him. But we have our answer today. This call is still alive and not limited for that time period. We should be able to reply and say, Oh Imam, we are here. We are here for you. We are the Muslims you speak of, the Muslims you perished for. You have not died in vain. We are your sons and daughters, your next of kin. We are your Shia Muslims and we will always remain united against tyranny, oppression, and injustice. Okay. Lastly, I'd like to end with a couple of words of what Bibi Zainab had said to Yazid. In the Zainab, Bibi Zainab had addressed the multitude of people rejoicing at the victory of the tyrant Yazid in Kufa. As looking straight at them, she said, Woe upon you, O people of Kufa. Do you realize which piece of Muhammad's heart you have severed? which pledge you have broken, whose blood you have shed, whose honor you have desecrated. It is not just Hussein whose headless body lies unburied in the burning sands of Karbala. It is the heart of the Holy Prophet. It is the very soul of Islam. At this time, we are approaching Arbaeen, and as many of you know, it marks 40 days after the 10th of Muharram Ashura. This is the time when they were finally released as prisoners. They said goodbye to their martyrs and started the journey back to Medina. Although they were free, their hearts were still in Karbala and Sham. Fatima Sugra al-Islam waited their arrival in inquiry of Sakina and Ali Azgar. Imam Zain al-Abidin held her close and said, my dear sister, those evil, Men did not spare our innocent six-month-old Ali Azgar when his throat was dry from thirst. Instead of giving him some water, they shot an arrow right through his throat. Oh, my sister, how can I explain to you the pain and grief that our father had to go through when he carried the young body of Ali Akbar? Meanwhile, Bibi Zainab visited the grave of her grandfather, the Holy Prophet. She sat by his grave and she complained with tears in her eyes. 
Oh my grandfather, look at what Yazid and his men did to our, your grandchildren. They killed your most beloved grandson, Imam Hussein. They killed Abbas when he went to get water for Sakina. They killed Ali Akbar, who looked like you. They killed my brother Hassan's son, Qasim. They killed my sons, On and Muhammad. They didn't even spare little Ali Asghar. Your beloved Sakina is also gone. She died in the dark prison of Sham. Bibi Zainab then went to her mother, Fatima salam, and said, Oh my dear mother, look at the blood-stained clothes of your son. Oh my mother, they paraded us in the streets of Kufa and Sham without our veils. A voice came from the grave. My dear child, I saw what they did. I was there when they beheaded my son. I was there when the guards slapped Sakina just for crying for her dead father. I was there when they paraded you on the streets of Sham without your veils. Bibi Zainab cried, Oh my mother, I have so much to tell you. Inna lillahi wa inna lihi rajiun. One uh, quick question um, that hopefully Sister Sabra can answer. Um, so basically, it's, uh, there's a lot of talk about female hijab, but what about male hijab? So you can come and answer that. Very interesting. Uh, Allah clearly mentions in the Holy Quran about say to the believing men that they should cast down their glances and guard their private parts by being chaste. This is better for them. Uh, Allah talks about the man to lower his gaze and then in the next verse he says that to the believing women that they should cast, cast down their glances as well and they should guard their private parts as well. Very interestingly Allah then talks about the hijab which is the physical and the spiritual and he talks about the hijab of the eyes you would be surprised to see that even in the Old Testament the hijab of the eyes what Jesus taught he says that you have heard that you will not commit adultery but I say unto you and this is exactly what because that part of the revelation because that part of the revelation was not adulterated by time. It is exactly what Allah says. He says, the Prophet Isa says, if a man looks at a woman with lust, he has already committed adultery with his heart. He needn't commit that act as yet if you understand what I say. And then it is said that the Quran also speaks about the lowering of the gaze. The hijab, it's a, the gaze is a spiritual disease. Imam says, An-nazru sahmun min sahmun iblis. The eyes, the look of a man and when it stays upon imam says the first glance is permissible and it is said the social hijab the interaction between men and women today we are in this room men and women together but here the niya the intention the social hijab where there is a limit to where I can interact. Imam says about, I will just speak to you about one hadith from um, Imam Baqar alayhi salvatu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam He says that a believer is the one who seeks the pleasure of Allah and the physical aspect of hijab for women, it shouldn't be tight, not too revealing, etc. At the same time, the hijab which has to be observed is the hijab of taqwa. 
Imam speaks, uh, Allah speaks, he says, O children of Adam, O children of Adam, we have bestowed garments upon you to cover your privacy as well as to be an adornment for you. But the garment of taqwa, it is the best. And it is said that this is the sign of Allah. He says, Imam goes on to say that when the, the nazar, the gaze of a man, the Prophet says, whoever looks at what is unlawful upon him, his eyes will be repentant ones on the day of judgment. And then he says, Imam goes on to say, and it is the fifth Imam Sadis, which is exceptionally, um, you know, it is uh, very relevant to the issue. He says, Imam says that whenever a man looks upon a woman, it is just not the eyes. It is about his piety that he's tearing through, that, that he has to work upon. And of course, for the woman also, as much as he has been asked to abstain, she has been asked to cover. And the duty, the responsibility is equal upon both. And Imam says, <laughs> It is said that when uh, the Prophet <coughs> was asked why this verse was revealed. He said that it was revealed because about the gazing, about the gaze which had to be lowered, that a man had followed a beautiful woman in the streets of Mecca, and he was so blinded by her that he walked into, it's kind of funny, but he walked into a tree <laughs> and his nose bled. Quite a similar, situation which could happen on the streets of Manhattan maybe when Walk you know a, a guy is looking at a girl and he just walks into something else like a bus so Allah is reliving that incident pardon me <laughs> yes and then so the prophet said what happened to your nose and why does it bleed and he he said I am embarrassed but because you are my prophet I have to tell you the truth because look this is the level of his marifat he says that even if I don't tell you the truth you already know it Amen. and that is the the belief you and I should have about the hujjat of the time that whether I hide it from him he already knows it that is the marifat and he says that um, the prophet says what happened and he explains the situation and it is said that the verse has already been revealed to me and tell the believing men to look down and abstain from what so it doesn't mean that you have to walk on the street like this. <laughs> but you have to abstain from what has been ordained as unlawful to you like you walk on the street and if you look at something it's fine but when you look and then you keep looking that's what the gaze is all about and more often than the physical hijab is the social hijab that if i i am observing hijab it does not yet give me the permissibility to have intermingling and you know joking and stuff i'm sure you understand what i'm saying so we look at this uh, and as important as it is for a woman to cover herself, it is equally important for the brother to lower his gaze. As important as it is for the man to lower his gaze, it is equally important for us to be aware of not only the physical aspect of hijab, but the social aspect of hijab as well. Um, I like to call on, uh, thank you sister, I like to call on Brother Zain Sayyid for uh, Anoha, and then after that, inshallah, we'll have Dua. Allah. <laughs> Oh, boss, you can't
बाबा का सीना क्या ढूंढ रही है जंगल में सकीना बस के बाजू या बाबा का सीना